Hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Fabio, should I kick this off or would you care to say an opening word? Uh, yeah, I think I think you can start. Hi, Drew. Um, hi to all. And uh, yeah, Drew, just feel free to uh, maybe kick it, kick it off and then uh, I'll take it on the open innovation. Yeah, cool. Thank you very much, Fabio. Yeah, welcome everybody to today's webinar on open innovation in the in the sector. Why should we fund open innovation? So you can see from uh, from the webcams up that we have a fantastic uh, panel to share some uh, insights with us, uh, and I have the privilege of opening today. So yeah, thank you very much uh, to to Fabio and N Access for. Uh, co-hosting this uh, this with us it's a, a topic that's uh, very uh, very close to our our heart and the, the way that we work so yeah my name is uh, drew corbin i'm the head of performance and investment at gogla i've been uh, working with gogla for about four years and um leading some of our interesting work on uh, tech and innovation and more recently uh, some of the finance and investment elements as well and for those of you that are not uh, familiar, Gogla is the industry association for the off-grid solar industry. We have some 230 members from around the world, from Guangzhou to San Francisco and London to Lusaka. They cover a, a range of uh, product categories from solar lanterns, solar home systems, uh, fridges and productive use technologies. And the aim of Gogla is to, to catalyze the market um, for, for 1 billion people that uh, live without access to energy and also to, to serve some of the, the weak grid market with, with backup supplies as well. We do this through um, our program areas of um, looking at policy and regulation, access to finance, so looking to increase investment in the industry, and company performance, including a uh, focus on technology and business innovation. So, yeah, it's, it's a real pleasure for me to, to be on uh, this webinar and introduce, uh, introduce the, the session today. Um, open innovation, I think, is really a, you know, a, a powerful tool and a natural approach for the, for the off-grid solar industry. You know, it's a, an industry that's um, you know, seeking to serve you know, the 700 million people in the world that don't have access to energy. You know, they are, by their, their very nature, you know, low-income vulnerable living in um in states of conflict and you know difficult uh, um, you know and volatile economies so it, it's a resource in industry to date there's been about two billion dollars of, of investment into the industry um you know we estimate that we need between 10 and 100 times this to achieve sdg7 and provide uh, access to energy for all it's also a young industry you know been around in the region of uh, you know 10 years or you know, maybe for, for Pago, something like uh, like six years. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's, it's resource thin and, you know, it, it's learning, it's expanding, it's innovating. So, um, and, and it's also, you know, a really tough, tough business, you know, serving low income people, difficult economies, you know, long supply chains. Um, we all know uh, what the, what the, some of the challenges around there, um, you know, over COVID and um, you know, the, the recent periods. Um, so companies are, are resource uh, resource thin, um, and open innovation really has some um, some very strong advantages to, to add here. You know, it can be a, a very cost effective way of, um, of 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 innovating and you know bringing um, you know products and services uh, to market. It can be a fast way to to learn and improve together as as an industry. And also, it um, you know creates opportunities for uh, for companies and consumers that um, you know more closed or proprietary models don't offer. Um, so yeah, I, I think you know open innovation is a is you know a very strong approach for the industry, and we'll be hearing about you know why we think um, you know donors and funders should fund it and and what the, the benefits of that can be. Um, I'd like to start by sharing a couple of tangible examples um, that, that Google has done on, on open innovation. Um, and I'd like to check if I can share my, ah, Artie, I think we've got them up, yeah. Um, oh, I saw a slide there and it disappeared. Uh, Artie, will you, um, will you share that or do you want me to? 
Let me try again. Cool. So that should be clear, right? Uh, yeah, we can see it just fine. You can see it. Cool. All right. So yeah, very quickly, um, a couple of examples. And this is the the Connect initiative that is uh, seeking to define a use universal connector and firmware standards for 12 volt SHS kits and appliances. We're doing this um, in partnership and with funding from Efficiency for Access and NXS Foundation. And yeah, there's, here's a quick um, look at the market. Uh, 3 million plus SHS kits sold in the last few years and 2 million plus appliances. We have 107 companies that are reporting uh, sales data for this, and yet there is no industry standard on, um, on connectors. It is not the case that all of these companies want proprietary or brand specific models. You know, there's a, simply a you know, no industry standard has meant that no, peop, no, no companies can follow this, uh, this interoperable market. And that is what we are seeking to change. So working with Google's technology working group and the partners, uh, we, have, uh, we are defining the technical requirements for this universal family of connectors. And you can see here, there's a, you know, a range um, you know, from the entry level low power dumb lights up to the high power um, fridges with uh, Pago controls. So that is, um, you know, got power and data that enables um, Pago activation and device control. Also, you have the, the, the USB for the, the mobile phone charging there as well. Um, and this slide shows the connectors, but actually we've defined a full interoperability stack. So you've got the, the, the physical connection, the electrical, characteristics, voltage, current, et cetera, communications protocol, and that's been working with uh, Solaris and OpenPago link. And then on top of that is Angaza's Nexus channel that um, defines the Pago activation and the device control. So with this, we, we seek to define a, you know, a universal interoperability standard that is voluntary for the industry. We think this can bring a, a range of um, outcomes, um, that will help manufacturers of appliances, SHS kits, distributors, and consumers um, to do, you know, to make the supply chain work better, you know, bring products to market quicker and cheaper, more efficiently in ways that will offer uh, flexibility and choice for consumers and, and ultimately um, lower prices as well. Our market vision, it's, um, you know, that proprietary brands, connect affiliates, and the op open ecosystem can coexist and compete as part of the commercial landscape. You know, it's, um, you know, open models aren't for everybody, you know, nor, nor should they be. We see that there is a role for all. Um, so yeah, I, th I think this is an interesting example of uh, open innovation. You know, we've, we've done a very participatory approach in terms of, you know, uh, defining objectives, defining the the, the technical guidelines and you know making them publicly available and you know we hope this can spur innovation and growth in the industry another quick example is from the Google's consumer protection code which is more of a kind of a you know a business business model and um, um, and uh, yeah kind of standard around policies and processes and we, we have a, an industry working group the consumer protection working group which is open to to all of our members and they define and maintain the standard which is uh, made up of these six six principles and they are expanded into 37 indicators which serve as a, a self-assessment tool for companies to measure monitor and report their performance and um, these are you know again are publicly available on the on the Google website and you know, they really get to the heart of a you know a paygo Pago company in terms of how they operate and manage their their credit risk and their product risk and their, their service risk uh, to, to consumers. And we're, we're in the process of developing a third party uh, scheme that will be available soon as well. And so, yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it was a very participatory process and that, that really helped kind of getting the, the buy-in from the industry. So, you know, we've now had commitments from, from more than 50 um, players, you know, um, you know, big, big, small, and everything in between. Um, and it's been endorsed by many of the industry's uh, investors and supporters. Um, and again, you know, this is a, you know, very much an open innovation and, and standard that we, we encourage a wider adoption from. 
Cool, so that's that's all the slides that I have to share. Um, oops. Yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, I think um, you know what's what what's um, been instrumental in both of these initiatives is is donor support. You know that we've both had um, had had you know strong donor partners in um, in, in both these initiatives, and they, they were really critical to um, you know I think. Um, to, to get things moving, you know, where any individual company would not have the resources to do it, um, you know, it's enabled us to to convene, to facilitate, you know, get get buy-in, and I think you know that's enabled you know broad kind of um, participation and, and ownership. Um, so yeah, we, we very much um, you know think um, donor donor support can be catalytic for open innovation in the industry, and we uh, we would warmly uh, welcome more. And uh, yeah, with that, I uh, look forward to. Um, hearing uh, from from the panel and um, you can see uh, who we have today um, top of the screen is uh, Fabio Pascal from uh, an access foundation and a, uh, a thought leader and uh, energetic supporter for uh, open innovation and uh, the, the brainchild for this uh, session today also Stephen Hunt um, the I think is it senior energy advisor Innovation expert from uh, for FCDO and a long term, long time supporter of uh, um, yeah, tech and business model in uh, innovation in the industry. We also have uh, Rebecca Rhodes from the the Gogler team. Um, Rebecca works as the senior project man program manager for consumer protection and technology, and uh, she, she's stepping in from uh, from Marie from uh, the Doom Foundation, who uh, unfortunately is. Um, come down with some some virus or other uh, so it's not able to make it today and then finally we have uh, Benjamin Stewart who's a data scientist and geographer at GIS open tools and data at the World Bank so I, I welcome the, the four four panelists to the stage and uh, Fabio I believe you're going to moderate the, the session so I'll hand it to you thank you very much thank you Drew thanks so much and thanks for the intro um uh, indeed I'm um humbly trying to uh, moderate today's session and I'm pretty happy about it because uh, uh, we had uh, a, of course, a prep call before this and already then the, the conversation started being so interesting. So I'm really looking forward to uh, where we're gonna go. Um, just a, a couple of words uh, uh, to, to set a bit the context and uh, um, you know define what we're talking about. Um, I think the very broad question is what is open innovation and how what are we talking about today uh, broadly? Uh, there, there can be a um, billion different definitions and all of them are pretty valid. Um, the way we look at open innovation, it's an all-encompassing term um, to um, effectively cover anything uh, that can be shared. Uh, so it can be uh, just open we will start with a simple open source, so that would be really software uh, focused. Uh, but in reality, uh, there is also open hardware. And so that we are just talking broadly about tools, so open tools at that point. Um, but it can go uh, much beyond that. It can go into op open business models, uh, or models that work in the sector and uh, uh, even lead to um, you know, open data. Probably. Um, what I do like is that in the panel today, we have a certain diversity uh, of experience, and uh, we have people that have experience with each and every of these parts. Uh, so, uh, Drew talked correctly about uh, the Connect initiative, uh, which is uh, uh, definitely more on the open tools and the open standards. Um, uh, while uh, uh, Ben, uh, with his experience at the World Bank, is uh, uh, probably going to talk about open tools and open data. And uh, uh, Stephen and FCDO have actually supported pretty much everything in there. Um, and, 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 and with this introduction, first was just about to say, what is open innovation? It's all of this. It's all of this. And, uh, um, and I think it's important that we maintain that breadth, that openness, that vagueness, if you want, in definition, for one reason. Um, Every single actor in the sector uh, will have a certain um, inclination to adopt or to uh, to work with a certain 
uh, part of open innovation. There's going to be actors that really push and and uh, embrace uh, open tools, open ho uh, open source uh, software or open hardware, while others will be much more inclined to go towards uh, open data. Now, uh, why is this important? Because um, my opinion is, in fact, that the the energy access sector is a sector which uh, relies very heavily uh, on distribution for success, um, more than other bits. There are other sectors which will uh, really be technology heavy. There are uh, sectors which are business model heavy and so forth. Um, energy access has uh, again and again proven that technology is a, an absolutely necessary enabler and uh, um, so are sound and healthy, uh, you know, financial models, access to finance is fundamental and so forth. But the reality is a lot of companies actually make it and can scale up because they are great at distribution. And funnily enough, distribution is one of those things that you just got to do. And so now the question is, can we open up all the other things that are underlying the substrate infrastructure in terms of open technologies, open tools and um, open data? Um, one, one last thing that I uh, want to mention, and then uh, I'm going to actually start having more interesting people talk. Um, one thing, the last thing I want to mention is one very common um, misconception about open innovation. Open doesn't mean free. Uh, there is a, a number of business models that are, uh, in fact, um, hinged on the idea of having an open approach and uh, sharing stuff uh, without necessarily becoming, I can't monetize it. Um, and so th there are a lot of examples of that in other sectors, uh, namely the, the software sector is, uh, is particularly um, mature in that sense. There is a lot of companies that work with open source software and um, open source products, yet make very healthy profits. So this is something definitely possible. Um, so um, I would not conflate the two concepts. That's a very, very obvious uh, uh, myth that we see when we talk about open innovation. Uh, rather, I would see um, open innovation as something that uh, one could want to uh, embrace, one could want to go towards open innovation as a, as a practitioner, as a funder, um, because that could help others while actually also helping uh, my own uh, organization or company. So this is just a couple of um, you know opening thoughts. Uh, now, this said, I am sort of even hoping that the people after me will um, disagree and we'll, we'll make this conversation very interesting. And I sort of uh, would be surprised. Uh, but let me just um, let me just go with a tour of the table. And uh, um, I would say, um, just going a bit random in terms of, of uh, order, I will ask the same one question to all of you now. Um, what's your experience with open innovation? Um, and, uh, you know, how did it go? Um, why did you uh, go towards open innovation in a specific case? Uh, essentially, the question is, tell us a story and tell us what happened. Um, Stephen, I'm going to start with you uh, randomly just because I see you uh, first in the screen. And then uh, um, I'm going to actually hit with Rebecca and then Benjamin. Um, Steve, the floor is yours and welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Fabio. <laughs> um... I'll maybe start with a slightly maybe controversial tack on this, but if you look at the history of, of DFID and now UK aid support to energy, energy access innovation, if you want to call it that, it really dates back to the late 90s. And the model then was basically fund NGOs who had some good ideas and they developed the first solar lantern. And then those NGOs were developing essentially open source materials they would develop like recommendations or technology and then they would try to get private sector to take them up you know and i think actually what you then saw in the next kind of middle decade or even a bit more is, is saying that actually wasn't the best model and we, and we, th we thought that market-based approaches where you actually support the private sector to develop the ideas and the technologies and, and to take them to market then you you, you aligned the incentives there because you weren't trying to, you weren't you weren't having a great idea then trying to get somebody else to do it you were you know you were backing the person who had the idea and then they would try and take it to market and then of course as you got into that you saw a lot more um 
um, you know, a lot of buy-in, but a lot more focus on, on intellectual property because these are then the private companies and, and they, they're trying to raise capital and they are to then they need to have something that what is what are you investing in what what do we own that, that then justifies the capital i'm sure we'll come back to this point um and so i think that and so that, that seemed to be going very you know there's lots of good examples and some good results there but i think i think it's maybe a bit more recently i think that the the, the a bit of a bit of a focus has also come on to some of the disadvantages of that kind of approach around about the market structure just kind of evolves but not necessarily in a way that really benefits the consumer <laughs> or the, the the ultimate objectives, which are delivering the SDG. And so I think this is where maybe we're coming now to a conversation a bit more about this question. Well, what rather than just letting the market go whichever direction it, it sees fit, and you get end up with twenty connectors that don't talk to each other, and then your customer, you know, your 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 person you're interested in, you know, customer, beneficiary, whatever you want to call them, they then can't plug their new appliance into their old solar system or they're locked in these things that i think that now starts to feel like it's the market system is, is not benefiting the objective so i think this is where i think there's some, some conversations to be had i'm sure today about this how you know so, so and we have then uh, you know in line with that recognition started to fund through efficiency for access coalition and through some of the in initiatives mentioned earlier on a bit more of these kind of enabling market-wide technologies to try and address some of these issues. I think we're quite in the early stages of that, but it feels like an important direction for me. And I'm glad to be involved in this conversation today. Same to me, I guess. Um, yeah, so I th I'm going to kind of go back. Fabi, you probably don't know this. So before Google, I actually used to work for um, Solaris of Grids. Um, out in uh, on their upside in in Tanzania but as you know like they they really are to me an example of a company that's kind of championing the open um, open philosophy and open approach and like you said it, it doesn't necessarily mean free but for them I see you know they, they've taken this on because for for their business model to succeed the sector the industry has to succeed as well and so they're fostering this development um you know the the open paygo uh, token and this is really going to kind of help the sector grow the distributors um you know succeed in in their businesses as well and so i think that kind of really that angle is is really interesting to me that that open innovation is about sector-wide improvements um and benefits not necessarily um you know business business kind of closed being closed off but for the for every business to succeed we need a sector that that's growing and profitable um and moving forward as well and that's also that the the kind of approach that we take in goggler is um you know we crowdsource best, best practice we we look to our members and we we try to identify where the um you know what's succeeding and what's helping companies and we really crowdsource that bring it together and then share it um and kind of turn it into tools and resources for the wider sector as well um, so for me that's kind of yet yeah, my experience and and the way that i i see um the benefits of, of open source for for us and uh, and the companies as well Uh, I, I think my perspective is a, a little different because I, I come from this from much more the software and data side, um, although I think that those are obviously important aspects to a lot of the things we're talking about. Uh, yeah, I was asked when we, when we sort of had a, a, a pre-meeting to, to sort of about my first experience with open data, and it's, it's, a, it's an interesting story. When I started my master's at the University of Victoria in 2008, my supervisor was uh, Dr. Mike Walder, a, a forester, and he was part of the Landsat Continuity Missions. That's a group that designs the Landsat satellites for the USGS and, and maintains the, well, like it says, the continuity of the set sensor. So Landsat has, it's not the best satellite, but it has a history going back to the 70s. When I started working for him was 2008. It was the first year that they had uh, made the Landsat archive available to the public. The previous way it had worked is you had to purchase an image. I think it was like three grand per image. Once that image was purchased by everyone, it was allowed to be used by anyone. It was an odd, odd commercial model, but it, it worked for a while. Anyway, in the first month that the Landsat, Ar Landsat archive was open, they distributed more images than in the entire history of the Landsat archive. Um, in the first paper I wrote for, for Mike, I downloaded 400 Landsat images. In his master's, he got two. 
and the second one he had to beg for so we could do a change detection. Um, I think open data in my experience with like in that experience and then much more in the World Bank as I've, as I've been there has been that open data and open data makes makes data accessible. Uh, I know that there are lots of data that can't be open. I know that there are other concerns, but as far as the sort of private versus open commercial versus open, I think that I think that open makes things available for innovation. I think open fosters innovation because it's hard to justify buying 400 images if they're $3,000 a pop. I, I downloaded them with the with, with no consideration because I was like, oh, will this work? Oh, let's try a different area. Oh, I can see half a lake here. Let's get the next image over. If I had to pay for that, I, you know, innovation becomes very complicated when you have to pay for mistakes. And I think openness allows us to sort of get away from that. Um, I, I, was, I was doing some research when I was when we were talking about this and I was looking at, so the World Bank has an open data policy and the open data policy is at its heart very simple that all of our data and work are by default open and you have to argue to make them not open. And it used to be that they were closed and you had to argue why you were allowed to publish it. Just that that's simple change. And there are lots of reasons why we why we don't publish data, mostly PII, security, lots of, lots of issues like that. Uh, but that also started in 2012 when I joined the World Bank. So. I think I've been a, a, an unwitting catalyst of the, these open programs, but again, at the World Bank, this, this, is, this has been really, really useful to have this idea that we don't have to argue to make things open. It just happens by default, um, and I think that that has spurred a lot of the development of not just open data, but a lot of the open tools that, that I'll, I'll get a chance to talk about later when we talk about sort of the work we've done in energy. But I really think that openness allows for both a much wider spread of the information, but then also the the ability to to innovate and, and move the move the work forward. So thank you, thank you all. Uh, this is uh, this is a, I think a great start. In fact, um, let me let me sort of connect between the the um, the three. But um, what I what I find particularly interesting is uh, the the notion that indeed uh, I think we all uh, believe that uh, you know a market driven approach is um, probably the most promising approach, and I think that's really under discussion. Um, but maybe I can also share what what an access does uh, in terms of uh, of funding. So we have uh, at an access a relatively simple uh, theory, and uh, it says whatever an access supports in terms of financial support must lead to an open source result. Um, we, um, in fact, are uh, most motivated by uh, or better we only accept projects that are uh, or proposals that are in fact driven by a company and so we want companies to be the innovators the only bit is uh, you know as as an access because um, as a, as a non-profit we believe that everything we do should be public good then we say well whatever we pay must be publicly available. If in the process we are directly benefiting one company, that's fine. There's no problem. Actually, it's good because as, as Stephen mentioned, uh, it would be the best way to have a champion for that particular innovation, someone that really believes in it and needs it in the first place. I think the only thing we do um, is, uh, is, in fact, try to preempt or try to forecast, uh, will there be others interested in this? And so that's a ranking that we use where we say, look, yeah, okay, this is clearly solving a problem for you. Um, can you, a proposing company, um, help us understand how many others have this problem and how many others will use this solution? Um, I also wanna say, and, and this might sound counterintuitive, we have found ourselves telling some companies, don't open source this, don't do this we can't see how else you'll make money. And so you should not be getting, uh, you know, uh, you should not go towards open innovation here unless uh, you and your board really agree on, you know, shifting your revenue model so that you can take full advantage of this. Of course, that came with the implication, we can't support you because we, we uh, must buy, uh, but the fact that we wanna have always a public good output, uh, that means that we cannot support anybody doing anything else in public good. Um, so with all this big blah, blah, um, shouldn't government do the same? 
uh, they're using taxpayers' money, shouldn't they also always enforce, uh, you know, public good outputs, uh, uh, also to avoid distorting markets? Um, so this is uh, to you, Stephen, and that's because Benjamin just told us they already do that. They, everything is open unless unless explicitly uh, said otherwise. Uh, how do you see that? Um, yeah. Yeah, so I think what Benjamin said, I think it, was, it is very interesting. And I 100% agree with what he said when it comes to data relating to, um, yeah, things like the energy system or like the geography. Or, I mean, we've, we've put a lot of money into um, renewable energy resource mapping, for example, you know, through the World Bank, which has then gone on to open, so, um, you know, the, the solar atlas. And those kind of things, I think they, they are like information about the world around us. Is, is actually it is a public good and, and and too many donor reports over the years have ended up kind of being on it used to be on like cd roms you know in people in, in kind of bookcases and then you know two years later another donor would commission the same study and that's crazy you know and i think that you know i'm, I'm hoping that that open street map use that kind of thing is really help where it gets a bit trickier is, it, is when it's to do with like technologies and business models and investability um, and we have, uh, um, I mean, on our research outputs, it's exactly the same. You know, we, we, the research outputs you know, have to be published and we've got a whole enor enormous online document repository of all the stuff we've, we've had to be published. But I think forcing the issue on IP ca can be really, really problematic. And we've had plenty of instances where we've backed companies who have developed IP and who have gone on to, 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 to generate you know, serious investment on that basis that they, I think I can't see how they would have got it if they, if they had not had some ownership of something, you know, related to, to back that up. And so, and yeah, so, so in, in all of our things, we, we have a, a quite a finely balanced IP clause, which basically says that the innovator keeps the IP because they're the one that want to, to develop it. We don't want to develop it. You know, we want it to happen, and we think that their leadership is more likely to make it happen than them coming up with something and trying to convince others to do it. But we have got a clause in there, um, which says that we have the right, we have a, a worldwide license to that, in the instance that some kind of horrible monopoly emerges. Because that's the other thing. Imagine if public funding of R and D created some miracle cure to start to a disease, and then you know it was protected by IP, and, and and everyone had to overpay for it globally. So there is there is a balance there, but I think we we don't we we try not to avoid we try to avoid taking categorical positions on these kind of things, and try to kind of do things which make sense. And I think what makes sense can also change a bit over time, and and, and how we support, for example, the household solar sector has changed a lot over time. You know, and I think that is that's where the, the, some of the vagueness can be useful. Um, that, that Fabio was mentioning. So Rebecca, to you, um, you guys have been uh, clearly going open innovation with Connect. Um, what's behind it? Uh, did you guys look into other models? Uh, were you looking at alternatives to that? And, um, uh, you know, yeah, what's the story there? Yeah, for me, I don't think it was ever really a, a decision process to, to go directly down one path it was more like the natural choice um of that this is what made sense for this initiative like Stephen said it, it each kind of um individual situation might have a different response and need a different approach so this is um yeah so something that that kind of seems quite um just quite quite natural and as drew mentioned you know we had the the technology working group that were kind of instrumental in defining the the, um, the sort of guideline guidelines that go into the connect initiative and the family of uh, connectors that we're working on the manufacturers you know that are involved these are the ones with the expertise and they don't just come from one company or another they're kind of spread out across the industry and so it's really key that we brought all of that together um, and you know, and also these are going to be the ones that that will adopt it eventually. Um, and to have that buy-in to achieve critical mass of adoption, which is what we want from open resources, um, I think is really critical as well. Um, but then we've you know also been working alongside Verisol to make sure that that what we are doing aligns with the kind of more more closed standards that are already the IEC um, Verisol standards on. Um, and testing and certification, and that's an ongoing 
um, conversation that, that is happening to make sure that the two align as well. Um, so yeah, so I think, yeah, the natural choice for us and also, you know, Goggler being a, a membership organization, um, it's a natural choice for, for Goggler as well. So I think we're kind of harvesting the expertise um, from across the, the sector um, and really trying to kind of just create something that, that makes sense for it, as many um, companies as possible. Um, but we also appreciate that what we do create, it's not going to be for every company. There's, there's different um, approaches um, and some companies will want to adopt it. Um, others will kind of want to stay within their proprietary model. And um, I think, yeah, for us, it, we see that the ecosystem of all those different approaches existing um, side by side. So actually, let me let me just follow on that uh, to to you, Rebecca. So, um, if you have to just guess the number, how many? Um, let me call it the apples uh, of the energy access that you have there. Like, how many are sticking to their lightning connector and will not let it go until someone really forces down the throat to go USB C? And how many instead are like, hey, no, actually, I love this. Someone is doing this job for me, and I'm just have to implement. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a, it's hard to put a number on. I would say, you know, for the for the open side of things, we have some leading companies that are really interested. Greenlight Planet, Bbox, um, Forsera, all involved and sort of championing that. And then on the other side, maybe two or three um, that we've spoken to that are, yeah, sticking with with what they've got and uh, are, are not so keen to to follow this path as well. You know, they've they've got something that works for them and it, it's doing well for them. So why change it? I guess from from their perspective. Thank you, um, uh, Ben. I'm, I'm I'm gonna go back to you just because I uh, y y we have touched very briefly uh, with uh, Stephen just a moment ago on the contractual side of this and uh, and. Um, um, as as uh, as someone who has um, been sort of advising companies on how to open source things, how to uh, you know go open, um, I realize that very often uh, the the nuances of which license am I choosing and all of that can can really be quickly very overwhelming. And so that's also what we uh, try to do. Um, we just like uh, just like uh, uh, Stephen mentioned, we have a very similar approach. IP stays with the innovator. IP stays with the company, uh, also because we don't want it. Uh, but we get a worldwide, uh, you know, uh, non-exclusive license to redistribute under open source licenses. Um, how do you guys do that? Because uh, you know, we are a bunch of people, and it's relatively easy to to put things in a contract, and I always think that World Bank is slightly more bureaucratic. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's funny about us being slightly more bureaucratic. I always think that, uh, but my wife works for the federal government, uh, so that I get a slice of what it looks like, the US federal government, so I get a slice of what it looks like on an even more bureaucratic side, so uh, I, I'm not sure where we fit in that. Uh, it, it's a really interesting problem, actually. We had, uh, uh, I, th I think I saw some KTH folks uh, in, uh, in, in the chat here. Uh, when we first, uh, K KTH developed the original global electrification platform, which is when I, which is what I started working on. Uh, really started leading a lot of open innovation in energy, um, and we had a really, really long procurement discussion that got really complicated because of uh, a 19th century Swedish law about IP that the person who creates IP owns the IP, even the, the companies don't. Right? It, it's 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 a really interesting law, uh, and we were developing everything in the open. The data was in the open. The tool that the onset tool that KTH was implementing was already in the open, uh, and it took six months to get our procurement to negotiate properly with with the K, with KTH, even though it was about open innovation. So so yeah, it, it is complicated. It is something that we. Uh, it's actually one of the reasons that I think you know in in in, in a lot of projects we have. Um, the openness allows a lot more flexibility, right? Like if we're developing a platform and it needs uh, user management. Our uh, IT departments in OIS will, will lose it. Like that's just so complicated and there's so many extra steps. Like, well, no, everything's open, just go and view it. Uh, so I, I think that, that, that that's valuable. I, I did want to come back to a, a little bit, I, th I think Stephen mentioned it, this, this idea of sort of openness, the, the tension between openness and IP. Because we've, we've been experiencing that even, even in this sort of geography realm where so much of what we're working on feels like public goods, but there's still companies that have IP that they want to protect. And I think actually, 
uh, it was mentioned earlier that uh, you you can sort of you can have black boxes along the production cycle along the line, as long as there are open interfaces between those black boxes. I think if that makes sense. So that's where the work on data standards, both in the inputs and outputs, make the most sense, right? So fine, you have your proprietary black box that does that creates really good output. This happens a lot when we work with at the World Bank. We've been doing a lot the last couple of years, really trying to experiment with like Silicon Valley machine learning companies. Um, and it's fascinating. We they they we buy data from them, and, they, and we say, "Great, can we share this?" And their response is, "No, of course not. What are you talking about? Nobody has ever asked if we could share their, share this data, because they're generally selling like predictive analytics to hedge funds." Uh, so we have to sort of really walk into the process of what does it mean? What can we share? Is it aggregated information? Is it is it specific types of outputs, but not all the outputs? And I think that that's where really where we get the idea of trying to sort of like rather than closed being this huge thing, like really sort of shrink the space that is closed and try to make more of it open, whether it's, and I, I like this discussion with hardware. I actually really like discussions of sort of energy access because in some cases it's really complicated. In other cases, it's really quite simple, right? We talk about the issues of clean cooking. The technology isn't, isn't particularly advanced, but it's, but it's really complicated to implement a simple solution on a huge scale. So in that case, things like standards become really, really important. So that's where I think a lot of the, when we talk about open innovation, it's not always like, ArcGIS versus QGIS, right? Licensed versus free. It's 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 a lot about developing standards that allow those programs to interface with, with each other, so that you can have like connectors in, in in solar systems, right? If you have a standard on that, then you know all of us who have, you know travel internationally, the number of plug adapters you have is a good example, of, you know, a good picture of, of how how the complication can come around. But I do think that that that's where it comes from. My perspective is is when we can't be completely open, try and try and sort of to pick out the pieces where open will allow for dissemination of, of, of better information. It's um, it, it, it's it's very interesting that, uh, that you mentioned this, and and I think there is another um, interesting aspect. We have uh, we have been supporting um, a, a new initiative called uh, uh, DREX, and um, essentially it's a renewable energy certificates, which are a way to monetize. Um, renewable energy generation. Now, what DREX is specifically trying to do is, in fact, bring this from where it already exists, uh, which is large solar farms, large wind farms and, and the likes, uh, actually bring it down to, you know, small mini grids or solar home system, very distributed uh, assets. And uh, um, while this has been, in fact, started by a company, um, actually a, a coalition of two or a, or a partnership between two companies, um, the reality is that we are now getting to a point in which uh, there, there is some sort of a need to go from, okay, you are the company and indeed you have our own way to monetize this uh, through maybe transaction fees or, you know, enabling the market. But we do believe that there is a very important role for a non-profit, you know, core uh, standard uh, that, uh, that is just going to be maintaining a standard, making sure that anybody can access that market that has been created. Um, and it's interesting, it has been a fascinating collaboration for us because from the very onset, um, it was very clear that we came into this um, innovation with very different eyes yet with a common goal we both wanted this to succeed because it would both enable you know that one company to you know have a profitable business but also the entire sector to now have space for more companies to do the same and create a standard that you know could really uh change things um uh, you know how um uh, public private partnerships have been a very hot word uh, uh, a few years ago everybody was uh, PPPs uh, I don't know what is the num the name of this if it's like for profit non profit partnership it's I don't think we have a phrase for that but um, but the reality is uh, that I also personally see a lot of open innovation opportunities in this particular cases where we have and I think connect is actually coming in as as another excellent example you know we have uh, a core which must be open, it must be open so that more and more people can adopt, more and more people can, uh, you know, participate, create innovation around that core. Uh, but then, you know, on top of that, we can have uh, close or just purely commercial business models that, you know, are just uh, the usual, uh, the usual approach. And so that's how the market driven still is uh, respected. Um, 
this um, leads to a, a last topic I wanted to uh, touch about, in fact, and it is the, the beyond. Um, what happens when we have an open innovation? What happens afterwards? Because we can uh, clearly the debate so far has been around uh, what is proper, what is right in terms of how do we create open innovation? What is in terms of what should we open and what we shouldn't? Now, let's say we have opened up something, how do we ensure that we maximize adoption? Um, and uh, here, in fact, I'm going to start with, uh, with you, Rebecca, just because uh, you guys are probably thinking about this right now. Like, how do you, how do you now ensure that as many people as possible use uh, Connect? Yeah, so actually, uh, it's timely. You know, we, we're about to release the, um, the technical guidelines and kind of source um, comments and, and feedback on, on that draft um, publicly. And so it's for that, it's, you know, raising awareness, making sure as many people in the um, and stakeholders in the sector, you know, are aware of that, um, which is one thing. And then, you know, actually bringing in all of that, that feedback and to, to refine um, and make it, you know, usable and suitable by as many as possible. Um, the other thing that we do is, is you know, through our working groups, um, we we have the tools, but then we kind of think, okay, we need to then advise, you know, how do you apply these tools? What's the best practice for for using these? Um, and I think that that is one um, key thing. You know, it's it's no good developing lots of um, open tools and resources and data if nobody knows where it is, knows how to use it or has the, the, the skills and resources to, to implement it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I think that that's one of um, one of sort of Goggler's main roles within the, the sector as well. Um, the... Stephen, how can you help? How can you help? In, in in this uh, with connect and with the others um I, I think uh, um, I'm looking at you for one reason um I think FCDO uh, well what one th one thing I think I really want to say about FCDO um well before it was called FCDO uh it has been in my experience one of the uh, most um fervent and avid and strongest supporters of energy access uh, I, I think I think the number of programs that uh, you know CFCDO as a core contributor and the, the different approaches that FCDO has is quite impressive and uh, and that's great so thank you um, but you know if if now we start having more open innovation um, is there a role that FCDO can have in in um, maximizing the adoption of open innovation solutions. Um, how can we work together? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, as I said, I mean, we've been happy to support, I think all of the ones mentioned earlier, the Solaris, Angaza, Connect, the 12 volt connector, green light planet stuff. So, I mean, I think we're, 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 we're very interested in this. We, we're this is part of our considerations. Um, you know, there's, there's always, a t I'm really glad actually that Gogla are leading on the convening. I think, and this is where Gogla has a lot to, of value to offer, because it's not for us to convene that. It really, it needs to come kind of out of the, out of the sector, but we can kind of say, you know, these are the things we think are important. And, you know, this is going to, I think, I think, I think back to one of Rebecca's earlier points, this is an, in the end, this is about the rising tide of effectiveness and impact in the whole sector, which should lift all the boats essentially of these companies, you know, and there's no benefit if you're going to hold on to something because it's in your company's interest, but it's not in the consumer's interest, in the end, you're going to lose, you know, and I think this is what's also the big, the big Googles and Apples and so they're, they're realizing that about their smart home stuff too. It doesn't actually make sense to have three smart home protocols if, 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 if consumers can't then do anything. So. I think I think I think that's I think that's the kind of the bigger picture, the kind of signal amongst the noise here, and that that's also in, in the funders' interest because we want to see those impacts. Um, I think you know in terms of like what we could more we could do. I mean, obviously as funders, that's one of the things we can do. Encourage other funders to take part. You know, I think obviously with, with IKEA we already fund you know in this kind of area together, but I think other I think other donors should be thinking about it as well. Um, I think I, I'm always cautious about the idea of like mandates you know on things we we do have the mandate on on sharing you know that, that public good research but but yeah i i th hopefully i think it is, it is about i think as rebecca was saying it's about getting that word out 
on the bigger picture that we're all part of the SDG seven story. And and I think also I think a lot a lot of people I think are really also really realizing that more and more the importance of the local businesses and the local businesses driving this forward. And and it's just not reasonable or realistic to expect them to develop their own technologies in all these different areas that, have all, that all the work has been done in. And I think where you see, and we need, I think the, the AFTB think we need 200 MCOPAs or something, you know, maybe that, that maybe MCOPA aren't thrilled about that, but I, 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 I think they can still be a leader in a sector in which there are lots of people benefit. And I think we've, we've seen like Easy Solar in Sierra Leone as an example I always like to use because, you know, they were able to start up on the back of so the different technologies that they could pull together to then make start making faster progress. I think that that's in the end what we want to see. So I, I do think we, you know we need to be part of a story of where we're trying to reduce the barriers to entry essentially and, and kind of make it easier for, for initiatives to, 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 to start delivering results. Um, and, and there are tensions there and I don't think we, we should sort of brush those under the carpet but I think that is the signal that we need to try and send. Thank you for that. Um, and, and just a note on that, in fact, um, I think one essential point, and not something we had the chance to touch about, but one essential point of open innovation is, uh, as you said, reducing the barriers and removing the barriers. I um, I think we have today a an energy access sector which is uh, very much uh, centered around relatively large VC-backed uh, companies. Um, and uh, and again, if we want to go towards SDG 7, the only way to actually achieve that is to parallelize the effort to an extent which is, um, you know, probably two or three order magnitudes in uh, higher than today. So meaning we will need to have a lot more companies that can do distribution, can do innovation uh, without having the, the same level of, uh, you know, investment support and financial support that the early stage companies have had so far. So I think that's also where open innovation can really play an important role, unlocking access to this market, to new players, to local companies in in uh, least developed countries as well. Um, ben, let me close with you. Um, how did you guys uh, maximize uh, open data access and how do you see open tools? And uh, I know you guys are working on GIS a lot. Um, how do you see the adoption going there? Uh, what's the plan there? Yeah, I, th I think a big uh, the, the 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 biggest aspect from from our side is is the sort of the the, the renewed focus on capacity building. I think uh, uh, ten, you know, t 10, 15 years ago, the the bank that our knowledge side was sort of the big glossy report, and I've I've never seen stacks of them in the in the break room back when I used to go to the office, uh, and they're still around. And I think sort of over the last ten years, we've transitioned from report to report and data, right? The data is being published alongside the report and that's that's part of the deliverable. And I think where we're going now is it's like, okay, the report's actually secondary. Primary is the data and tools, right? So, so it's not just the data, it's the code and the, and the tools used to pr produce it are, are hopefully made open, if not made open, at least do documented well. And I, but that's happened recently. The, the final step is then, okay, now we have this data and tools, what do we do with it? Well, we actually teach people how to use it in our client countries. And that's where I've seen the, the biggest innovation with, and that's, that's what we're doing a lot in a lot of our energy work. It's not enough to generate a least cost electrification plan. It's to then hand over the tools to the client government so that they can rerun with their own information, right? Like the distribution network we're using in our model is pretty garbage. It's a combination of old data and predicted data. We know that, and we also know it's the most important factor in determining the success of the model. So we're never going to get the best distribution data from, well, maybe never say never, but allowing allowing the companies to, to do this themselves, it, would, would, it really sort of allows us, gets us better plans and allows them to keep things up to date, right? As soon as, you know, every 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 model or math we generate is, is outdated the second we press send, because there's changes in the in the in the terrain, so I think that um, that's really it. It's, it's you know it used to be reports, then reports and data, then data and code with report on the back end, and now it's like data and code capacity building, and there are some reports generated as it's as is necessary and required in the in the process. Thank you, Ben. That's that's uh, fascinating, and uh, what I find particularly fascinating is that uh, World Bank is clearly sort of. Uh, in a sense, some steps ahead, and I think we can take a lot of learnings from that end. So thank you for that. Um, I, I will pass it back to uh, to Drew from some closing remarks, but I just want to take the opportunity to uh, thank you all because uh, this has been very interesting. Thank you. I was really hoping for that. Drew, to you. Yeah, 
Thank you very much, Fabio, and thank you to, to all of the past panelists. Indeed, it was it was fascinating to to take her through a a journey through the different eras of uh, innovation and the philosophies uh, around it. And yeah, I think it's um, clear to see that we're in a you know a, a period where you know open innovation is is recognised for its its benefits and opportunities. Um, like the, what Stephen said about the the rising tide uh, lifts all boats. You know, I think it's about creating a, you know, a, a bigger market. And um, there's a, an expression I heard that um, you know, this should be about um, open innovation as as a as a foundation for growth, not as a basis for commoditization. And we want it to enable you know new business models, new new partnerships, specialization. You know, a, kind of a whole new new foundation in which we can. Um, you know, creates uh, opportunity and, and innovation. And, um, you know, I think there's, there's tons of interesting examples happening along the, you know, the hardware, the, the, the data, the, the firmware, and, you know, how, how donors um, and the sector support players catalyze the market. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much uh, for, for all, um, for, for sharing all of these insights and experiences. It was, it was fascinating. Um, we've, um, we've seen that uh, you can, um, continue this discussion in the NAccess Open Innovation Community. Uh, please uh, check that out. You can, you can submit your idea now. We have a few clicks already. Um, but yeah, um, with that, uh, I think we, we can uh, close and, and wrap up. Um, so thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much to NAccess, uh, FCDO and World Bank. It was a, it was a pleasure and let's uh, continue this uh, discussion in the community and through our other links and events. Have a great day, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.